Hello, one and all, and welcome to this stream on Hugh Selwyn Morbley, where I'm going to go through Pan's poem, Hugh Selwyn Morbley, try glean my understanding of it that I have so far. Um, and through that, I might dig up some uh, gaps I have in my own mind, because it's a difficult one to grasp. You're trying to get of all, all the references, Pan's own life, the classical tradition references, the non-classical references he's trying to get from the troubadours and so on and then it's really you're trying to encapsulate all of this in a single work coming right at the end of the great war so we'll see what comes up as i just go through it because i think it's time to air out my understanding that i have so far i've been reading three texts in relation to this pan's personae uh which i read years ago probably around 2017, 16. And I have my notes, little annotations that I made at the time. So that'll help me go through it. And I'll share a screen, bring you through the text as I read through it as well. I've also been reading Pan's uh, biography by a, a David Moody, part one, which leads up until 1920, his farewell to London in 1920, culminating with... Uh, the poem he sold morbidly, which he called, in essence, his farewell to London, as well as um, what he wanted to do by 1920 was to be able to write as an American in London, in a uh, high British imperial society, a poetical version of what Henry James had already done in the novel form. So in a way, Morbidly is Henry James' novel condensed into a poetic form from Pan's perspective. And then finally, I've gotten the Penguin Classics Early Writings of Pan, which has a bit more on annotations, just in case my own writing didn't come up with anything uh, insightful enough that we wanted more references. So we'll see where this takes us. Let's start with the introduction that we get from the early writings, Penguin's classical tradition. And I'll bring up the text here. So, early readers of the poem had difficulty distinguishing between Pound and the persona of Morbidly. So Pound is going to try and use a persona. This is similar to the um, technique used by earlier Victorian uh, poet Browning, as well as Eliot, think uh, Proof Rock. So, there's, there is a difference between Pound and Morbidly, but it's hard to distinguish them as you go through the poem. I'll try and point out where I believe one is coming from one Morbidly position and one's coming from the Pound position. But we're going to we're gonna say, were they the same or not? I'm going to argue, no, they're not. Morbidly is a much more wider, encompassing character uh, than, than Pound himself. Morbidly is meant to be uh, symbolic of the wider age and the wider literary movement. Pound argued they were different, but readers persisted in linking the two. Another issue was the construction of the work. Their sections simply arbitrary, joined together. Um, answers can be found through identifying Pound's sources, largely French sources. Indeed, Pound's models, uh, his work on the rhythms for Gautier and Bayon, poets had recently reread for the long article, a study in French poets. So he essentially creates the person of Mobley appears in the latter half of the poem, uh, in contrast to Pound, a mask of contemporary aesthete to show the what the minor artists could expect uh, from the England of the day. So the poet's place in society and its focus. So he begins with an ode, which is ironic. It's on Pound himself. This is the ode we see in front of us here. Ode pour l'élection de son sepulcre. And then he's going to shift into his own age, exposing society prevents the artist from fully realizing his own potential because of the commercialization of money which is substituted aesthetic pound is looking for beauty alone and beauty in his work and what he sees in the london pre-great war london is an overly commercialized society democracy is also turned towards self-corruption and he'll bring us in in parts two and three sections four and four four and five of the climax of pound's denunciation underscored by the Great War. So Pound himself didn't fight in the Great War, but he, of course he was very close to many who did, uh, like 
Ford Maddox Schufer, and of course some of his close contemporaries. T. E. Hume died. Uh, he was a uh, one of the early people in Pan Circle as he moved to London in 1908, who helped him guide him through literary London. And uh, sculptors like Godier Brzezka, who Pan wanted to involve in his Imagist movement. And so around those sections four and five, we're going to see World War I, Sacrifice of the Young Dying, Deceased Tradition, all of these sort of themes come to the fore. There's going to be throwbacks to pre-Raphaelite conditions in Uglock, where he's going to try and compare what the pre-Raphaelites were trying to do in the middle 19th century to what the politicians are doing or the established aesthetical mode of the time through Ruskin. So Gladstone and Ruskin come in and trying to rub up against Brissetti uh, and Browning and the likes. And then Sienna Mife, he goes back to his Dante roots. So all of this lies ahead of us. And then, of course, after that, he goes into his contacts, Bren Bam, Mr. Nixon, etc. So let's go through the poem itself then and see what we get. Yusuf Mobley, part one, life and contacts. As we said, the life will come in first and then the contacts in the later part of part one. He starts with this quotation, Vocat Eis Das Nombrum by Nemesianus, and he takes it from his fourth eclogue. So Nemesianus uh, flourished about 283 AD in the court of Carus, a late emperor who only reigned for about a year. So it's a very obscure reference. And it's interesting that he, first of all, the Latin translation comes as he calls us into the shade. So it's a very obscure reference then. What's Pound going for here? We have to remember by the time he's produced Moberly, he has already produced homage to Sextus Propertius, in which he's already linked the time of Propertius in the imperial grandeur up Perseus in the court of Augustus to his own time and the character of himself somewhat to Perseus. By bringing in an Amicianus here, what he's shown is that he's going even later empire um, away from the Augustan golden age um, to, you know, 283 AD, one of these late obscure court poets that is, is this the sort of life that awaits the poetical esthete going forward? I believe that's the sort of nod he's going for here. And so the first part of the poem is this ode pour l'élection de son sepulcre, an election for his own tomb. That line is taken from uh, Pierre Ronsard, the French poet from the 16th century, who was probably the most famous uh, member of the Pleiades. Again, they were a group that, if you're following my series on Hyatt's classical tradition, they're a group that have, were trying in the 16th century to bring French and French poetry to a level that they could say was on a par with uh, the Latin and Greek ancients. And so the election for his own tomb, we see that throughout this whole work, the poet will fail to encapsulate the, uh, the aesthetical vision that he has for society. So there's a little bit of that, but he's, by being the poet in this time, he is electing for his own tomb, but actually with the Ronsard quotation, he could be bringing in the fact that Ronsard wanted to elect his own French language up to a level of the ancients and ultimately failed to, like his Frankiad is not known as much as his Aeneid, as Virgil's Aeneid. So in that sense, Ronsard failed to elevate himself to the correct level. For three years out of key with his time, he strove to resuscitate the dead art of poetry, to maintain the sublime in the old sense, wrong from the start. So the three years here, could be pound 1905 to 08 where he'd finished in hamilton college but he'd yet to go to europe or it could mean um pound 1911 to 14 so not he moves to london in 1908 but then he has uh he, he does go back to the states in 1911 from 1911 to 1914 there's an unbreaking period in which he is in london so it's likely that he's talking about that latter period it's when he flourishes through t.e hume goes into Ford Maddox Hufer and mo starts moving in those literary circles, coming up with his ideas of imagisme or for eventually vorticism with Wyndham Lewis before the war breaks out. So I think he's talking about those three years. 1911 to 1914 is the scene he's setting here. For three years, he strove to resuscitate the dead art of poetry, to maintain the sublime. Of course, you're thinking about Longinus's uh, tract on the sublime, this aesthetical version which did encapsulate Pound in his, in his youth. He was obsessed with Longinus on 
uh, sublimity, as well as Dante's uh, Dante's Purgatorio, um, his entire Divine Comedy, to be fair. And he wanted to write his own epic worthy of Dante, etc. So that's where the sense of the actual word sublime is coming from. But wrong from the start. No, hardly but he'd be seeing, been born in a half, savage country out of date, bent resolutely on wringing lilies from the acorn. Capaneus strapped for factitious bait. It's half savage country there is an allusion to America. He's coming from the half savage country. America doesn't have the literary tradition of London or the old world at the time. So this is where part one, it's much more pound himself than the wider figure of Morberly. And he's bent resolutely on wringing lilies from the acorn. Uh, sort of, and the, this is a, a, an attempt, right? So the lilies you can associate with the pre-Raphaelite painters uh, like Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Um, so Capaneus tried for factitious bait then. Capaneus is the warrior in Aeschylus' Seven against Thebes who is scaling Thebes, trying to take it back with, um, I think it's Polynices against Dethiocles. I forget which one's trying to defend Thebes and one's trying to take it. These are brothers at war. Capaneus aids with the one trying to take it. He's scaling the walls and he lets out this boast that he is above Zeus, above the gods. They cannot tame his spirit. So he's associated with this arrogance. Zeus strikes him down with a lightning bolt. So Capaneus, pound or somewhat more believe, but a little bit more pound at this point, wants to wring lilies from the acorns, uh, you know, bring sublimity back to poetry. And this is all a boast. The bo this is a, akin to the boast of Capaneus. And then he brings in the lines from the Odyssey. Id men gartoi panth, oseni troie, caught in the unstopped ear, giving the rock small leeway, the chopped seas held him there for that year. So this is straight from the Odyssey, and it's the Song of the Sirens. Id men gartoi panth, oseni troie, for we know all those who suffered in Troy. So picture that's that passage from the Odyssey where Odysseus hears them and he has to be tied to the mast so as not so there's, they don't call him away from his mission to get home. So likewise, Pound goes to London and he and he sees and feels these distractions, material distractions, uh, everyday distractions of the high empire in London, the, probably the greatest city in the world at that time. And he's getting the distractions similar to what Odysseus had got. His true Penelope was Flaubert, the Penelope being the wife of Odysseus. So he's still using that Odyssey um, linkage there. But the true Penelope being Flaubert. So Pound's true Penelope, his true wife, is Flaubert, in, an, in essence. And what he means there is his literary, his literary lifelong companion. So Flaubert, what Flaubert had done to literature in style, in the 19th century, this is Gustave Flaubert, French novelist, uh, who wrote Madame Bovary and um, Ed, Le, Le, L'Education Sentimentale, Sentimental Education. Pound loved the style that he saw there. So he's wedded to that style, the similar way Odysseus was wedded to Penelope, and he's trying to get there. That's his mission. So his true Penelope was Flaubert. He fished by obstinate isles, observed the elegance of Circe's hair rather than the mottos on sundials. Little nod there to the elegance of Circe's hair. Of course, that's a distraction that Odysseus undergoes, but it's also a little nod to um, Pan's obsession with the sublime, but also the beautiful, rather than the mottos on sundials. A motto on sundial, for me, there is is when... If you know the mottos on sundials, you know this like phraseology Latin. You don't understand the beauty of, or the Greek, whatever the motto happens to be written in, but you don't understand the beauty. You don't actually understand those ancient civilizations. That's what he's trying to get to. When you know the mottos on sundials, you're, you've gone through an educational system, but only know the language as little tracts to be reverberated, to be reci um, recited, rather than the understanding of the whole civilization and the beauty that it had. Unaffected by the march of events, he passed from men's memory in Land Trontinium de Sonnage. The case presents no adjunct to the Muse's diadem. So, Land Trontinium, uh, that's his 30th year. It's sometimes written as Land Trontinium in, in my work, howsoever. 
And when Pan reached 30, so he was born in 1885, he would have reached 30 halfway through the year, uh, through the war, 1915. So he's, again, talking a lot about himself. He's unaffected by the march of events because he's not, by 1915, called into the war. Um, it's 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 funny in in the biography when uh, Moody's biography when the war breaks out, Pound's life uh, doesn't really change that much, but a lot of his circle have gone off to fight. Goudier uh, Brzezka, the sculptor, and I have some of his sculptures up here that you can see, would die in 1915, the same year that Pound turned 30. So, uh, Pan thought he was the greatest sculptor of their age and would herald in this new uh, sort of sense of modernity that Pan had yet described as modernist. He, he would have described it more within his vorticist idea. And there we have uh, the Emperor Carus, who I said was associated with the opening quote by Nemesianus. So he turns 30, and when he, the, when he turns 30 in 1915, Pan did say to Eliot, or I believe it was Eliot, anyway, it was either Eliot or uh, one of the circle, perhaps Quinn, more the financier, more the agent, that when a man's turned 30, his greatest work of all has always been created. He's lost the fire somewhat. Um, so there's that sense that he felt that it hit 1915. He'd been unaffected by these march of events, and he still hadn't produced the works which would define him. And so that's part one. So now we're going to go away from just the election of his own tomb, this bit of the poet wandering around, not finding anything, and get into a bit more of the Moberly and what the age demanded. The age demanded an image of its accelerated grimace, something for the modern stage, not at any rate an attic grace. Attic grace, think of the actual beauty involved in the ancient world, not just mottos on sundials. Quality over quantity as well comes in here. Not, not certainly obscure reveries of the inward gaze. Better mendacities than the classics in paraphrase. So mendacities is the telling of lies. You know, better to tell an outwards lie than tell the classics in, in a paraphrase. In a way which is suggestive of it, but completely not them, not authentically the classics. And the obscure reveries of the inward gaze is kind of almost a man's pinnacle if he can. This is what Pan thought with imagism, right? That he was going to create a, a work which would spiral into a pure image that could represent things such as the obscure reverie of the inward gaze. That's what high art could achieve. The age demanded chiefly a mold in plaster. So we had the, him bemoaning the lack of quality, and now we're going to see instead we just get quantity. Cheap goods, that's what mold and plaster is. You're not you're no longer the artist staring at a block of marble here when you get to this point, picturing the complete image underneath and then revealing it to the world when you're doing plaster. Your plaster cast, the work already exists, and you're just cheaply reproducing it. So the age demanded chiefly a mold and plaster made with no loss of time, a prose kinema, not assuredly alabaster or the sculpture of rhyme. And of course, what he ties in there is that the sculpture, the re revelation from the alabaster is like how a poet can have the revelation. Uh, this is, again, his imagist belief. The revelation can reveal itself through the poem. The image will reveal itself through the poem. Part three. The tea rose, tea gown, etc. supplants the musseline of Kos. Musseline of Kos, one of the ancient wonders of the world. The pianola... Places, Sappho's Barabitos. Pianola, sort of piano that could play itself. So again, uh, technology becoming mimicry. That's what plaster cast. It can create these great marbles, but it's 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 it's, it's a mimicral sense of what was gone before. There is no high art or authenticity to it from the artist's point of view, from Longinus's trees on the sublime point of view. And the pianola replaces Sappho's Barabitos. So the Barabitos is the lyre that Sappho would play to as she created her odes. So searching for Sappho. Christ follows Dionysus. Phallic and Ambrosial made way for macerations. Caliban casts out Ariel. So of course the first line there of the second quatrain is 
fairly self-explanatory. He sees religion disappearing amongst the quantity and Christ himself and what has been there from the Middle Ages outwards in the in the Christian religion is going to fade the, the same way Dionysus faded for the ancients. What he's witnessing now, just before and now just after the Great War, is the coming in of the modern age where it's all about material possessions. And he made way for macerations. Caliban casts out Ariel comes from uh, Shakespeare's Tempest, where Ariel is under the uh, under the control of the uh, magician Prospero, and there's this uh, you know Calib where it get cast out of of the island in the Tempest. Ariel and there's a sense when Ariel gets cast out, that world, that island in Shakespeare's play loses its sense of divinity. And Caliban is the uh, more material man who's just shipwrecked upon it and doesn't understand the beauty that he's doing when he's casting Ariel out. There's a there's a piece on it in in, in Montaigne's On Cannibals, which uh, I might bring in uh, in a separate video. All things are a flowing, sage Heraclitus says, but a tawdry cheapness shall outlast our days. And of course, he brings in the pre Socratics there. Heraclitus, all things are flowing. So everything's in flux. And he would have seen that in the Great War, sense of flux, sense of changing dynamism to the world. But then there's then there's this underlying pessimism. The tawdry cheapness shall outlast our days. After Dionysus or St. Paul, what's going to happen? Well, even Christian beauty defects after Samothrace, Samothrace being the island St. Paul would have gone through um, on his journey to Rome. We see Tukalon, literally beauty, decreed in the marketplace. And he actually has pound as an earlier poem called Tukalon, meaning beauty uh, in ancient Greek. And, but it was decreed to the marketplace. It fell upon no ears worthy uh, to listen to it. Fawn's flesh is not for us, nor the saint's vision. We have the press for wafer, franchise for circumcision. Again, an elaboration on the material marketplace overcoming attic grace. Flawn's flesh is related to Dionysus. I'll just show you the lines here. Fawn's flesh is not to us, nor the saint's vision. We have press for wafer franchise for circumcision. And of course, market is God. Press, as in the press the news is the wafer people will take it every day read the newspaper that's become the wafer all men in law are equals free of pisistratus we choose a knave or an eunuch to rule over us pisistratus the athenian tyrant so this is where the critique of democracy comes in which says all men in law are equals in this year you know just before the outbreak of the war Free of Pesistratus, the tyrant, anyone listening to my Plutarch series when I'm on the parallel lives of Salon and Publicola, Salon is the decreer of the laws in ancient Athens. And he comes after Draco, so after the Draconian laws, but before Pesistratus. Salon's laws get somewhat corrupted by Pesistratus. This is the, uh, the more traditional reading of uh, Western literature of the Salon Pisistratus relationship. Pisistratus is the tyrant, usurps uh, the laws. So 1914, we're getting the herald of democracy. We're meant to be free of Pisistratus. And all this is to pound is a man choosing whether a knave or a eunuch will rule over us. The classic, I get to choose an option between two fools. Uh, Bright Apollo, Tinandra Tenua Tinatheon. What god, man, or hero shall I place a tin wreath upon? So the Tinandra Tenroa Tinatheon is straight from Pindar. And so the uh, the supplication of himself to uh, Apollo, the god of music, truth, and beauty, right? He's trying to find beauty. So of course he's going to invoke Apollo. And then immediately he goes in with the Pindaric lines because he wants to invoke ancient Greece. And Pindar would, of course, give celebration to the olympian heroes it's it's kind of the classic ode not for the election of his own tomb in pindar's sense but for the election 
of a great hero to a pantheon worthy of worthy to be called out. But of course, then Pan turns it on his head. All he can do, Pindar could look to the Olympian athletes and give them praise. Pound can only uh, ask what fool to place a tin wreath upon. Part four. The war has now been broken out. These fought in any case, some believing pro domo in any case, sense of flux when these fought. Some quick to arm, some for adventure, some from fear of weakness, some from fear of censure. Some for love of slaughter in imagination, learning later. Some in fear, learning love of slaughter. And what he's got here is you don't just have the, you know, the war poets, Wilfred Owen or Sieg Siegfried Sassoon, where they're lamenting the war. He's trying to actually sh show you, yes, some did that and some thought they were going in uh, for a great cause and fighting for king and country etc but some also went in with great skepticism and then learned that they loved the slaughter they learned that they loved the camaraderie of the trenches and so pound is trying to show you there the two sides of the trench experience and often it was uh, hypocritical to what they had thought of going in before they actually experienced it man in action learns uh what the thing itself is not by him thinking of it as something that's going to happen before he enters it and again this is quite a greek mode of thought when plutarch is writing his parallel lives he's finding the moral impetus for their the greatness of the lives they're in through their actions alone and if they don't act it out then the morality is lessened this is a much more ancient idea of morality than a christian one in which the inward man can show inward uh, morality just simply him reflecting upon himself pound of course wants to invoke the ancient sense of beauty and in so doing he's got to call out similar ancient senses of morality what do they actually act out in the trenches summon fear learning love of slaughter died some pro patria non dulce non at decor walked eye deep in hell believing in old men's lies then unbelieving came home home to a lie, home to many deceits, home to old lies and new infamy. And what we have there is, right, believing in old men's lives and unbelieving. This is where they come back and the politician's rhetoric is no longer the same. Their belief in the institutions they inhabit is no longer the same. Uh, Britain's sense of the imperial sense of grandeur is no longer the same you're going to have a struggle to go back into the gold standard you're going to have the general strike of 1926 why then did they fight all they seemed to do was lose their confidence in their whole civilization came home home to a lie home to many deceits home to old lies and new infamy so the new infamy would just be the greater de degeneration of society in the 1920s, the lacks of the, the lacking of the morals. But the old lies would be they saw that the same, the same precipitous uh, fall of civilizational rigor was that that had been there preceding 1914. It's still there. The war didn't solve anything. Daring as never before, wastage as never before. Young blood and high blood, fair cheeks and fine bodies. Fortitude as never before. Frankness as never before, delusions as never told in the old days, hysterias, trench confessions, and laughter out of dead bellies. A sense of flux, of the Heracliton sense, all things are flowing. But then, you know, frankness as never before, things as never before. So things are moving and fluxing, but also heading towards a collapse. They're spiraling down. This is the opposite of what he wanted out of his vorticism in which out of the spiral, out of the dynamism, could come the single image or the great piece of poetry or beauty. Part five. There died a myriad and of the best among them, for an old bitch gone in the teeth, for a botched civilization. Think of this, um, and of the best among them, an allusion to the fact that many of the upper class died at, in greater proportional numbers. So the leaders that were going to be the 20th century leaders of Britain and to to other extents, France, though I don't know the numbers of 
their aristocratic numbers compared to the common numbers. But in Britain, the officer classes died at a much greater rate. They were all leaders. It's the best among them. For an old bitch gone on the teeth, for a botched civilization. We already know what he thinks of, of London in the 1910s. Charm smiling at the good mouth. Quick eyes gone under earth's lid. So this is the innocence before the slaughter. For two gross of broken statues, for a few thousand battered books. I think what he's getting at there is for two gross of broken statues. So broken statues already before the war, a few thousand battered books, the classical tradition or that tradition, which it was meant to be invoke a beauty in civilization. It already faded away. You look. Gladstone was still respected when John Ruskin produced King's Treasuries. Swinburne and Rossetti still abused. Feated Buchanan lifted up his voice when that fawn's head of hers became a pastime for painters and adulterers. So Ugluck is sea green eyes. And in the 1800s, that was associated with representing classical beauty. Um, uh, Pound himself was constantly fixed on this idea of, you had, remember you have the... Uh, Quick eyes gone under Earth's lid. The eye was a window to the soul, of course. So green eyes was meant to be window to, to the beautiful soul or that idea of something pure and beautiful. And again, we, this is what we talked about earlier. Ruskin and Gladstone are representative of the British imposed standard. Swinburne and Rossetti are not. They're meant to be um, sort of pre-Raphaelites looking for that greater sense of beauty that pound is a little bit closer to but i think he never includes them in the great pantheon uh, there's one piece where he's writing to i think it's harriet monroe one of his editors or else she's an acquaintance of one of his editors and he's giving her a list of all of the great poets she needs to go through to know the traditions to get to where to pound is and of course he starts with all of greece right all of greece he's enamored with you can see it's more enamored with greece here than rome that sense of beauty that they had then he says, oh, Horace Ovid, mainly out of the Romans, not Virgil, noticeably. And then he says some basic stuff out of the Anglo-Saxon ones, not much. Much more interested in the troubadours. He wrote a poem near Perigord, in which he tried to relive the adventures of Bertrand de Brun. And he was constantly touring around Toulouse in and Languedoc and wrote many poems around about Languedoc and the, the Provencal troubadourian fashion. If you were going through the uh, my video on Hyatt or going through the classical tradition with Hyatt, he knows the troubadour is not a classical tradition. It emerged out of uh, Southern France itself separately. Pound loved it, Hyatt. He speaks less of it because he's a classicist and he deems it not in the classical tradition. But Pound was obsessed with this. In fact, he was uh, a lecturer on Romance languages, these sort of ancient French languages before he went to London. So he knew a lot about them, but he would say, go to go through the ancients and the, then go to the troubadours. And then he would love the French up to Gautier in the 19th century. And from a novel in point of view, he said Stendhal and Flaubert were who you need to read. And he glosses over the English a lot, including Swinburne and Rossetti. Uh, he was most allured by Browning because he would have the Browning style of delivering the poem through a persona, which Pound is doing right here. But he was not enamored with Wordsworth or a Byron or any of these. He did not deem them great. So it is interesting. He's trying to contrast Swinburne and Rossetti against Ruskin and Gladstone, but um, perhaps that still abused line is indicative of the fact he kind of felt had fallen away uh, with his love for Swinburne by the time he wrote Hugh Selvin Moberly. Feated Buchanan lifted up his voice when that fawn's head of her, hers became a pastime for painters and adulterers. So Buchanan is, was a critic of Swinburne and Rossetti at the time. And what he's trying to say is, Pound at this point had be he'd been a critic himself for many times. And towards the end of the war in 1918, he, he realized, I need to stop writing prose. What he meant by that was criticism. And he needed to create his works. And then out of that come his first few cantos, come his uh, How Much to Sex is Propertius, and, and also come his Husserl and Moberly. So I think when Buchanan, he's, he was, he's attacking the critic. And we see this in sense with Ford, Maddox Ford, before the war known as Ford, Maddox Hufer, Pound's uh, contemporary, 
and and uh, moving in the same literary circles as him, a colleague in that sense, or his acquaintance, writes the character of McMaster in Parade's End, who is a critic, literally, of Rossetti. Uh, so they're both, they would have shared conversations, hoofer and pound about this, no doubt. They both the, the fact they both fall on the idea of the critic of Rossetti being a degenerate form in the poet itself. And then the fawn's head is Elizabeth uh, Seidel, I believe, who is uh, was a muse to the, to Rossetti, I believe. Let me just try and confirm that. No, it's not mentioned. I was just seeing if it was mentioned in here. It's not, but I believe that she was a muse. So the fawn's head of hers became a pastime for painters and adulterers. She, it'd be, I think she lived quite a loose life, uh, this Elizabeth Seidel. And then he moves on to another one who moved in these late Victorian, mid to late Victorian circles. The Burne Jones cartons have preserved her eyes, that of Elizabeth. Still at the Tate, they teach Cafetua to rhapsodize. And so Cafetua is actually mentioned. Cafetra is uh, Elizabeth Saddle modeled for uh, Burne Jones's Cafetua and the Beggar Maid of 1884. So that is a particular painting Pound is trying to pay our attention to here. Again, what he's trying to talk about in all of you, Glock, is how you had a sense of someone trying to achieve the sublime in the old sense in mid to late Victorian world, but it was crushed by a Gladstone or a Ruskin uh, sense of authority in Pound's eyes. I would be a little more lenient towards Ruskin than Pound, but uh, Pound was a very opinionated person. So, Cafetua, to rhapsodize, thin like brook water with a vacant gaze. The English Rubaiyat was still born in those days. So, what she's saying is, what Pound is saying is, he's in the Tate, and he would have walked in the Tate. He would have been in... Um, in London at these times, staring at these paintings. And what he says is, it's they were trying to capture something that was already gone. The English Rubaiyat is a direct call to the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam by Fitzgerald, in which he claimed, Fitzgerald, that he had discovered these ancient texts from Arabia, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, and that they were translations. He had translated them. But of course, as it emerged later, uh, or slowly, they were more his own work. And what he was trying, he was trying to tap into an Orientalism by claiming they were translations. This is similar to what happened with the Ossian tales from Scots Gaelic in the late 18th century. You try and claim they're authentic but Oriental, and the public lap them up, or the critic laps them up. Then when it comes out that it was more your own work, but you were in a persona mode trying to, um, you know, Fitzgerald in his own sense was trying to embody his sense of Persian civilization, for instance, with the Rubaiyat. The critics started turning against you on that. And Pound experienced this uh, genuinely himself when he had released Homage of Sextus Propertius, which came before this. And he gave out that critics were saying, well, this is, he's trying to translate Propertius, but he's doing a terrible job. And the old classicists from the institutions were saying this, that his translations of Propertius were poor. And I think what Pound says, was, it's no more a translation then Fitzgerald was translating uh, Omar Khayyam. And I think he's giving a, a little jibe there, but what he's saying is even back then when Fitzgerald had the Rubaiyat, it was still born, death before birth. The thin clear gaze, the same still darts out fawn-like from that half ruined face, questing and passive. Ah, poor Jenny's case. Bewildered that a world showed no surprise at last, Macero's adulteries. Macero, of course, being a pimp. Jenny being an, um, one of the females dressed in a Rossetti poem. Siena mi fe, disfacemi morema, from Dante's Purgatory. And when I said in around 1900 to 1905, pound. Uh, he would have read Swinburne. He would have read Rossetti. Now, he developed away from these slowly. He was also obsessed with Dante. But Dante stayed with him. He wanted to write his own version of the Divine Comedy, which eventually he does in his own eyes, in a modernist sense, 
in a sense that comes has to come after the Great War in his with his cantos. But what he's doing here is also, as he's taking you through this life of contacts, if you sell a mobile, he's taking you through his own uh, poetical inspirations. So he had the Swinburne piece where he was obsessed with Swinburne and Rossetti, and then he has the piece where he was obsessed with Dante. So this is the Dante piece, a call like the Dante's Purgatory. Um, and, and of course, what you also have here is it's from Dante's Purgatory, where he's drifting, right? And this is the whole sense of what's happening here to the poet or the aesthete. You couldn't give a hell or a paradiso reference to Dante. It has to be from Purgatorio, where he's got no compass. Among the pickled fetuses and bottled bones engaged in perfecting the catalogue, I found the last scion of the senatorial families of Strasbourg, Monsieur Varog. So the last remnants of classic families really is what he's saying. He talks about a senatorial family, someone who could trace their, their lineage all the way back to the centers of Rome or to the Alsace-Lorraine. Um, ancient Burgundy, something like this. For two hours, he talked of Galifet, a French general, of Dawson, the Rhymers Club. Told me how Johnson Lionel died falling from a high stool in a pub. So Galifet is a French general, but he's also represent. Uh, he is French general who repressed the pa Paris Commune in 1871. So the senatorial family of Strasbourg bit of a reactionary you can see he's sitting uh, you know, i found him there amongst the pickled fetuses and bottled bones an old aristocrat of some sort this is where the contacts are going to start to come in monsieur Varog. uh the last it, it also the last of the french imperialists repressing the french commune but then it comes in the third republic and france leads on its way where germany overpowers it and all of this is leading to the great war and so we'll just have a look at what's said about some of these other characters, because there's a few characters that slipped out there. Monsieur Varag is what they reckon here is Victor Plar, uh, 1863 to 1929, a member of the Rhymers Club, author of In the Dorian Mood, which we'll come into later, the Dorian Mood, and librarian of the Royal College of Surgeons. Plough was born near Strasbourg, came to England after the Franco-Prussian War. Pound mentions him at the end of Sienna Me Fay. Galifet is Gaston Galifet, French general in the Franco-Prussian War who led a cavalry charge at the Sedan. Dawson, or Dowson, Ernest Dowson, 1867 to 1900, poet, admi uh, Pound actually admired for epitomizing a decade, 1900 to 1910. You'll often talk of the, the decades being epitomized by certain characters. We'll see this later when he comes into Mr. Nixon. Pound cited Dawson's poem, Kinara, as an early influence on his life. And the Rhymers Club was a group formed in the early 90s by Yeats. Ernest Rice, uh, T.W. Rolleston, members included Dowson, Lionel Johnson, Victor Plar, Arthur Simmons. Uh, Pound praised them to... Floyd Dell celebrating their work. So when Pan went to London, we said he mentioned he had um, contacts like T.E. Hume um, and then eventually uh, Ford Maddox Schufer. But he was he wanted most of all to move in the circles of Yeats. And Yeats was the big show uh, in London. And he would move between Dublin and London at the time, Yeats, opening plays and so on. But he was the guy through his Celtic mysticism Pound believes it tapped into something of, say, wanting to reinvigorate the poetical mind. You know, Yeats, he, he saw Yeats going back to the Irish heroic age, and he wanted to do that, but on a much wider circle. He saw a vivacity to Yeats. Of course, when he comes to actually meet Yeats, he does respect him, but he slowly drifts away from him. And he moves away from respecting Hoofer and Yeats more to realizing the dynamism is going to line people like T.S. Eliot and James Joyce. And that's going to be much more where he believes the, the literary movement is going to go. So you have a little call out here to that, 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 that phase of Pan's life with the Rhymers Club. The next. So Dawson, you liked him. But how Johnson Lionel, these are all you know, died falling from a high stool in the pub, the sort of tragedy which would happen to the Rhymers Club. And of course, Johnson shows no trace of alcohol at the autopsy, privately performed, tissue preserved. Pure mind arose towards Newman as the whiskey war. Uh, that's direct call to John Henry Newman, Anglo-Catholic, later uh, convert to Roman Catholicism. 
So it's sort of failed, a failed movement in and of itself, the Anglo-Catholic movement. Dawson found harlots cheaper than hotels, headlam for uplift, image impartially imbued, with raptures for Bacchus, Terpsichore, and the church. So spoke the author of the Dorian Mood. As we say, the Dorian Mood, he's talking about Victor Plar. So the notes in this in this uh, Penguin's classic say Monsieur Varag is uh, Victor Plar. But I believe the senatorial families of Strasbourg is, is explicitly trying to hark back to something even older than the Rhymers Club. He finds this dusty collection of a man. But with the, with the author of the Dorian Mood, he's explicitly talking about Victor Plar uh, and a chief catalogue. Monsieur Varag, out of the step of the decade, detached from his contemporaries, neglected by the young, because of these reveries. Brenbaum, so the next of the contacts. Sky like limpid eyes, the circular infant's face, stiffness from spats to collar, never relaxing into grace. Heavy memories of Horeb Sinai and the 40 years showed only when the daylight fell, level across the face. Of uh, Brenbaum the impeccable. So this is an interesting one, the contact of Brenbaum. There's a suggestion that it was Sir Max Baerbaum, a caricaturist, which kind of leads into the first quatrain. Um, stiffness from spats to color, never relaxing into grace. But then this invocation of the heavy memories of Sinai, 40 years, take you out of that, take you much back to as if he's, he's talking about some sort of Semitic tradition. And there isn't much of an elaboration in um in the early writings either but there, there seems to be some sort of revolution of character in bren bam that i can't quite pin my head on bren bam the impeccable as if this man with the stiff collar when the daylight catches him or the daylight fell reveals his older character right somebody who has seen perhaps a jewish man comes from the um old tradition and reveals the character of a man whose people have gone through Horeb Sinai in the 40 years. But then, of course, you have the call out uh, Brennebaum, which literally means burning tree in German. So, the, uh, or burning bush, right? So it's difficult to know exactly uh, what he's trying to do there. And I might do an addendum to this if when I rifle back through the biography and the... Um, these are mobly parts of this. I might do an addendum where I've ironed out some things I've left out of this run through. The next contact, Mr. Nixon, meant to be the American capitalist, really, and that with that name. The cream gilded cabin of a steam yacht, Mr. Nixon advised me kindly to advance with fewer dangers of delay. Consider carefully the reviewer. I was as poor as you are when I began. I got, of course, advance on royalties at 50 at first, said Mr. Nixon. Follow me and take a column even if you have to work free. Butter reviewers, from 50 to 300, I rose in 18 months. The hardest nut I had to crack was Dr. Dundas. So if we head to the back of um, our penguins, classic. Mr. Nixon. Pan said Mr. Nixon was a fictitious name for a real person. That person was likely a prolific journalist, editor, and novelist. They reckon actually it was Arnold Bennett, 1867 to 1931, who Pan probably met through Ford Maddox Ford. So for me, I picture the American capitalist. That's probably just Nixon, the name Nixon imposing me far too much a sense of 1970s America than it should. But it does uh, picture someone who has made their way up through the world, a uh, Fleet Street man, perhaps. You do have to remember Pan. For Pand, London was the imperial city. London was the, the capital of finance before the war. So Nixon being of that world does make more sense. Um, but here he's saying, give up poetry. This is meant to be the allure of the money classes saying, yeah, I used to have a, a poetical incentive or that, that state of mind, but I have to get the graft of this world, the 20th century world, as it's brimming up in front of Pand. Dr. Dundas, I think, is just some reference to Someone he had, to, he had to get the better of. I never mention a man with a view of selling my own works. Tip's a good one. As for literature, gives no man a sinecure. Sinecure, of course, being the job that pays well. Uh, and no one knows it. Cite a masterpiece. Give up verse, my boy. There's nothing in it. 
No one knows inside a masterpiece is genuinely a call out too. I think when, I mean, Pan would have experienced this multiple times, but I think with say he, uh, how much the sex is precious, it, it didn't do too well to begin with. And he said, I'm not worried about that because something quite close to these lines no one knows inside a masterpiece uh and actually once the war ended in 1918 pound realized uh, he, it was a sort of a double downing effect he realized if everything is going to become super transitory um it was more important than him for him than ever to create the poet poetical work which would last the centuries something which could last beyond the flux so it wasn't one of these abandoned mo your, your poetical ideals moment, but a doubling down moment for Pound. And um, Mr. Nixon is meant to embody the temptation to abandon the ideal. Likewise, a friend of Blogrooms once advised me, don't kick against the pricks, accept opinion. The 90s tried your game and died. There's nothing in it. Blogroom was, um, I mean, that's a direct reference to a Browning poem. So the 90s being the 1890s, the Yates Rhymers Club style uh, vision, right? They tried your vision, tried Celtic mysticism and all that. They tried your game and died. The world moved on towards its material fate. Part 10. And so therefore we're left awaiting the poet. Beneath the sagging roof, the stylus has taken shelter, unpaid, uncelebrated at last from the world's welter. Nature receives him with a placid and uneducated mistress. He exercises his talent and the soil meets his distress. The haven from sophistications and contentions leaks through its thatch. He offers succulent cooking. The door has a creaking latch. This is just pure imagery from, from Pand. No sort of allusion to anything else other than the poet taking shelter in these years. And again, we have, we have this call out to Dawson earlier, right? This poet he, he respected, but... Uh, was that he found harlots cheaper than hotels. So he um, he clearly fell to the allure of women and Pound himself would have been no, not alien to this. He got kicked out of Spain uh, earlier in his life. Uh, I believe he was heading in a college in Spain. He got kicked out for some sort of promiscuous activity sent back to America. And so you have this part 11, Conservatrix of Malaysian, um, Malaysian being of Miletus, again, a Greek island. So this appeal of beauty from the natural Greek world. The conservatrix, right? Can we con concern this this word conservatrix? Habits of mind and feeling, possibly. So in militus, possibly you can have this. But in Ealing, the most bank clerky of Englishmen, no. Malaysian is an exaggeration. Apologies. Part twelve is going to be the allure. Eleven is the um, the com comparison of militus to to Ealing. No, Malaysian is an exaggeration. So Mil Miletus is like his idea of, can we still preserve something? The uh, Greek island of Miletus. No. Right, we're in Ealing. Ealing is uh, king of the world now. The bank clerky Englishman. No instinct has survived in her, older than those her grandmother told her would fit her station. Part 12. Daphne with her thighs and bark stretches towards me her leafy hands, subjectively. In the stuffed satin drawing room I await the Lady Valentine's commands. So Daphne turned to it is straight from Ovid, the tale of Daphne, turned to a tree when she tried to escape Apollo. Um, and so the escaping of Apollo, remember he's already invoked Apollo earlier, Tinandra Tinora Tinateon, the Pindarica invocation. So in a way, you try and escape Apollo, you're left with the Ovidian moment where he can turn you to bark. He can he can make you dead wood. So in the sat stuff satin drawing rooms or the women's drawing rooms, he awaits Lady Valentine's. Will he will he be subservient to the to the call and the, the allure of the mistresses? Knowing my coat has never been of precisely the fashion to stimulate her in her durable passion. So he's moving around London society, and he also feels like he's moving around these relationships. Of course, by this time, Pound was mar married to Dorothy Shakespeare. So he's not this is not particularly Pound at this moment, but it is Pound at other moments and it is the experience of london that one can expect this is his farewell to london it's not simply meant to be him at the end of the war uh, it's meant to be his farewell to london and the whole idea of what a poet can expect rocking up to london in the era of 1910 to 1920. 
That was somewhat of the value of well-gowned approbation of literary effort, but never of the Lady Valentine's vocation, which is a sort of suggestion there of what, how Lady of the Night that vocation might be. Poetry, her borders of ideas. He's now fading out of uh, Hugh Solomon Mobley part one. The edge uncertain, but a means of blending with other strata where the lower and higher have ending. A hook to catch Lady Jane's attention. A hook to catch Lady, Lady Jane's attention is the idea of, will I just be spitting out simple poetry? Remember the Ronsard call. Ode pour l'élection de son sepulchre was a call out to Pierre Ronsard, who is known now for his little love songs and love trinkets. When he really wanted to be, you know, he was part of the Pleiades, he wanted the Frankiad, he wanted to make French a great poetical language. Remembered now today, for his little love poetries. Pan's thinking a little bit the same. Is that what the fate of the poet would be? A little hook to catch Lady Jane's attention. Modulation towards the theatre, also in the case of revolution, a possible friend and comforter. Conduct, on the other hand, the soul, which the highest cultures have nourished, to Fleet Street where Dr. Johnson flourished. Beside this thoroughfare, the sale of half hose has long since superseded the cultivation of Pierian roses. So Pierian roses, Pierian being from um, a place, I believe, is that the place in southern France where it is a place where from which early poetry uh, would have been seen to spring out. This sense Pierian here. Of course, Fleet Street where Dr. Johnson flourished. It's hard to know what he would have made of Dr. Johnson, more the critic than the than the poet. Um, conduct of the soul, of course, the highest cultures have flourished he's all he's, it's all a little model of musings of where london was dr johnson again he's a critic he's not he wasn't a complete man of materiality yet he was never the one to, to enter himself into the great pantheon of writers as as an original writer so then we're left with the envoy back into a more rigid form to close it off go dunborn book tell her that sang me once that song of laws Right, Laws being the um, the old English uh, writer of the uh, musical writer of the 17th century, and Pan would have sp spoken to musicians of the time who also believed. Remember, this was the time of Elgar, and you would have a, a late bloom in English uh, musical uh, musical pers personal uh, musical uh, personalities. Laws would have been seen as the last of these beforehand, and so he's thinking this. Tell her that sang, sang me once that song of laws. I want to go back to when laws was there. Hast thou but song as thou hast subjects known? And again, look at the language. He's gone straight back to that sort of uh, faux Shakespearean language. Then were the cause in thee that should condone even my faults that heavy upon me lie and build her glories their longevity. Tell her that sheds the treasure in the air. Wrecking naught else but that her graces give life to the moment I would bid them live, as roses might in magic amber laid, red overwrought with orange and all made, one substance and one colour, braving time. Tell her that goes with song upon her lips, but sings. Not out the song, nor knows the maker of it. Some other mouth may be as fair as hers, might in new ages gain her worshippers, when our two dusts with wallows shall be laid, sifting on siftings in oblivion, till change hath broken down all things save beauty alone. So we added a much more rigid poetical form using the faux Shakespearean language for his envoy. Now there is a part two, but I think I'll save that for another video. Um, and what he's trying to do with this envoy is encapsulate that he can still write the poet poem as people can recognize it, uh, but also, but also add in the theme at the end, right? Sifting on sifting to oblivion, the sense of purgatorial stagnation that's been going on. Um, and so I'll just see if there's any fading out notes here. Pierian roses, we said, it's also an allusion to a line from Sappho. For you have no claim to the Pierian roses addressed to a young girl, Pieria, in Greece, who is a reputed home of the muses, so i.e. the home of poetry. Laws, Henry Laws, set to music, Go Lovely, Rose, and other poems by Edmund Waller. 
Um, so what he's doing is trying to invoke that, that is those sort of guys. And I think that's going to close out everything from part one. I'll pick it up with part two. And uh, let me know if you enjoyed this, if you felt I missed out on anything. It's always good to have a discussion and broaden the uh, understanding of this poem because there's a lot packed to pound. And there's a lot to sink your teeth in and there's a lot to then permeate in your thoughts thereafter. Until the next time.